Hey everyone, it's Peter Kerr from Rock Daydream Nation, and today I've got special guest Joe B from The Contrarians. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Not too bad, not too bad. Today we're going to cover an album that has been forgotten. Um, This band is one of the supergroups of the 70s, hard rock legends. Um, They made a comeback in 1984, which got a lot of heat. And you may be familiar with this album, Deep Purple, Perfect Strangers, Deep Purple. So Deep Purple, come back 1984, fantastic. It was a, uh, a big tour, very lucrative. Um, I think, Joe, in the US, it was second only in gross to Bruce Springsteen. Right. They were basically, you know, almost at the top of the, the hard rock world. Yes. Then... Um, you know, finished touring, a little bit of a gap, started recording the follow-up, and it was this album, The House of the Blue Light, which came out in 1987. Didn't do as well. Um, so in the States, I think it reached 90, um, number 34. Um, I don't think it's even attained gold status. In the UK, it reached um, number 10, uh, went silver, and I think to date is only uh, sort of done 2.5 million copies. In Deep Purple's catalogue, that's probably underperforming. They did a bit of a tour of the States off the back of it. Richie, I think, injured himself and the tour got cancelled. And you could virtually say a lot of momentum um, was lost in regards to Deep Purple after that initial uh, wave of 1984 and the Perfect Strangers tour. So this album was probably not critically lauded in the day. Uh, To a lot of people, it was a disappointment. It didn't get received well, um, didn't generate any hits. Uh, There were a few songs that uh, made it to the radio, which you and I will discuss, but it didn't have generate the interest that uh, Perfect Strangers did off that initial, um, you know, um, the comeback tour. So, Joe, what are your thoughts about this album? And maybe just talk about a couple of tracks that you like or don't like, and we'll, we'll go from there. So I absolutely love this album, and I liked it a lot when it came out. And thanks to you, I've been listening to it the last week, and I like it even more. Um, it gets slagged. I know that John Lord and Richie Blackmore and Ian Gillen say they try, and, you know, they tried to do something contemporary at the moment. But for 1987, I really enjoyed this album. And I, I really like it more. There's almost every song is pretty strong as far as I'm concerned. You know, my history with Deep Purple is, you know, they were that band that I liked Smoke on the Water or my woman, uh, you know, woman from Tokyo. And you would hear them and you liked it. But like Kiss was the band that really exploded for me, um, you know, when I really got deep in. And but I, you know, so I went back, but I really enjoyed Deep Purple. I actually like Mark III version a little bit better. I like Burn because that Made in Europe album. But uh, Perfect Strangers, the reunion, I was totally pumped about. The one thing is I never saw the band live. I, it, it, and I've been to hundreds of concerts. I've seen Whitesnake countless times. I've mm-hmm. seen, I've seen uh, Glenn Hughes solo several times. His last tour about three, four years ago, he did all uh, Coverdale um, era, you know, Mark, Mach 3 and Mark 4 uh, purple classics. But I never saw this classic lineup. But when this album was released, I really enjoyed it. Um, I don't think there's a, there's a couple songs that might, I could skip maybe towards the end, but I, it's one after another. And I remember buying it and putting it on. And, you know, I always like, I always like consistency in life and in music. And I was happy that this core deep purple, you know, the most famous version got back together, had tons of success with perfect strangers. And with this album, I was, I was pleasantly surprised. I'm like, this is, I kind of even like this better than perfect strangers. And I was, I had this, you know, at the time you're young and you have this opinion that, okay, they're going to stay together, you know, and they're going to conquer the world again. And that just didn't happen. Yep. And uh, it, it, it's, it, it, was, it was a disappointment for me. I, it, they kind of you know, fell off the map after this album. You know, I never got into Slaves and Masters afterwards. But um, as far as an album, like I said, I really liked it when it came out. I listened to it often because 
I bought it because I was so pumped about the Perfect Strangers reunion. And then I just like, I'm like, hey, this song's really good. This song's really good. This, song, you know, and I listen to it now, and I and I like it even more thanks to you. Yeah. Oh, no, don't have to thank me, but uh, yeah. it's been it's been yeah, there so my, my ammo yeah. on uh, yeah. contrarian is usually, you know, I, yeah. I if I hate it, I I, I skip yeah. with it, you know, like and 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 if I like it, I like it. But this one, yeah. I like. I even like it even more now that I listen to it. And I haven't listened to it in a while, but. I never had any any problems with this album. I don't see it as why it was. I maybe because it didn't sell well, and mm. that, you know, it, Richie Blackmore is always um, a wild card there, and I know he always had a contentious relationship with Ian Gillen, mm. so maybe that's what happened. But uh, yeah. I, I have no problem with this album. I like it a lot. Absolutely. So. Um- in America, what, uh, did you hear any of the songs off this album on radio? Did it? Uh, did you see any of the clips on MTV? Because the two songs off the album um, were the first one, "Bad Attitude," which right. is a which is a corker of a song, and yes. then "Call of the Wild," which is a, a very poppy song, probably their most commercial song ever, and it had this yeah. wild and crazy MTV clip. Do you recall um, it was played on the radio in the day, or so I don't remember clips on MTV. You know, rock radio in Chicago was pretty lame in the 80s, uh, yeah. especially, you know, it was more, it was nonstop um, Peter Gabriel, U2, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sting, you know, it was, and Bruce Springsteen. So yeah. not a lot of hard rock. Um, yeah. So I don't remember being played on the radio at all. I, MTV, I can remember the Call of the Wild video, Yeah, but that's about it. Uh, but I was in my own world musically anyway. Um uh, you know, in, in, in this period of music, too, I just got out of college. I graduated college 86, and I was kind of like, uh, you know, I got my degree. What? And then the music scene for me, I know a lot of people like this period, but um, I don't know. This music, the music scene from like 86, 87, 88 was really weak for me. Um, and I think it started with Cliff Burton dying with Metallica and, I, and, and, and uh, I don't know. It, it, things really didn't kickstart for me. Uh, my excitement for music till the late eighties and then the early nineties, you know, yeah. I, I, I love the nineties era, but this album was a pleasant surprise. I, I think, you know, if you look at 87, it's definitely overshadowed by that white snake album that came out. You know, oh after, after, yeah. After, yeah. Cause that's uh, sold in the bucket loads. <laughs> oh yeah. So that was, that's yeah. all you saw on MTV and that's all you heard on the radio. Mm. And, you know, then the Tawny Katane, yeah. you know, David Coverdale thing. But um, that's the only thing I could really remember is, that and after buying the album i thought for sure that this is gonna this is gonna last you know they're gonna be mm. consistent this this unit would stay together but yeah just didn't happen yeah absolutely absolutely do you think the um the album cover um what, what do you think of the album cover that the house of the blue light um do you think that yeah, might have not sold the band so well because like you look at this album cover and i think this is making a statement dp yeah great purple, great album right. and then yeah. you've got this you know it's like behind the green door well i mean you know, yeah, I know. Well, what's yeah. this all about you know it's kinda, it, yeah it, it, it doesn't really sell it because people you know the kids are going to go into the uh, the walmarts they're going to go into their music stores and they're going to look at that versus what others hip and happening in the metal world and right. it doesn't really it's not really a hard sell um i i looked it up on um the internet last night just to see what is the background of the house of the blue light and it was taken out of uh a little richard song good golly miss molly which was okay. referenced in speed king because yeah. uh, there's a lyric called house of the blue light so that's kind of obscure but what does it mean um and I, um, I think it didn't do themselves any favors by this kind of it, they're trying to make it mysterious you open the door right. and it's kind of zeppelin-ish because if you look at the um the door it's got all these different sort of um symbols and um there's a lot of zeppelin in this album isn't there? there's kind of a little bit zeppelin sounding yeah even it, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because even perfect strangers kind of has that cashmere-ish and and i think they went there with this but again i I don't mind it, you know. It, oh, I, I, I don't mind you know, it at all. But even going back is, with Richie in Stargazer, you right. know, because that's the original, like, I think Richie heard K 
Cashmere and said, I can do better than that. And he probably did, but that's my opinion yeah. with Stargazer. No, I, yeah. Stargazer and he's, and he's always done that sort of Indian, that sort of mystical sort of chord progression, but strange ways. Um, and there's a few mm. other sort of, you can right. f- sort of Zeppelin-ish type of um, feel to some of these songs, but yeah, definitely, yeah, definitely Perfect Strangers. Definitely, yeah. But, you know, it's interesting because you bring up Richie and that, that plays obviously a huge part in this. Yeah. Um, I always had this opinion that he was kind of like subdued on Perfect Strangers in this album. But, you know, now because we're talking about it, I listen to it. And he's constantly riffing on these albums. Yeah. And doing phenomenal work. So it's not a lot of chord progressions, but it's a lot of, you know, background riffs and everything. And they, Absolutely. You know, and I've yeah. got a theory about Richie. If uh, you can tell if he's engaged and not by the level of participation he has on the song. So if he doesn't like a song, um, you won't hear much of him. He might just put a, a little bit of a rat tat tat here and there. But um, yeah. you know, like the the second song on this album is the Unwritten Law, and right. um, it's basically got a synthesizer, a sequence, a riff, a bass, and you've got Pacey and the drums, and you hardly hear. Blackmore play maybe a little bit of guitar at the end and I'm thinking no I don't he probably didn't like that song because Richie's that sort of guy if he doesn't like it he'll just put his guitar down and yeah I know (laughs) although he writes every one of the songs on these albums yes he does yeah but apparently this was a really really tough slog they um it wasn't a good so everyone was excited to be in Vermont when they did Perfect Strangers. They did the high fives, you know, haven't seen you in years. Everyone was happy right. with each other. But this was a tough slog, um, House of the Blue Light. And I don't think it was a fun um, gig for them to, you know, lay down these tracks. And a lot of the tracks were actually re-recorded. So, um, and if you're re-recording and you're re-recording, um, I think that, you know, it can get the irritation up and when you've got two alpha males in the band and let's face it you've got it's an interesting band because there's no one leader there are two alpha males and they just go for it hammer and tongs you've got gillen and you've got blackmore right. and um that's what makes the deep purple story so interesting because um when they're at it at hammer and tongs it creatively it makes it exciting yeah um, it does but, but in this think- yeah I do think Deep Purple's, and even, you know, you go back to interviews when the first, the second incarnation broke up, um, you know, when, when Roger Glover and, and Ian Gillen were out of the band. Mm. I, I, I feel as though their legacy was tarnished because of so many lineup changes. You know, even though a certain extent it happened to Van Halen, you know, they got back at the end, they got back together with Roth and everything. But I always saw a parallel between these two bands because they changed singers and they had the lineup changes. And yep. you know, actually, Van Halen went through three singers. And, you know, but yeah, I, I, Deep Purple should be on that level with Zeppelin, Who, Beatles, and that, as far as I'm concerned. But because they were always had that lineup issue, um, they're, they're like, they're perceived as a level down. Yeah. But, uh, well, they're you know, huge in Europe. In Europe, they yeah, are regarded, yeah. in Europe and England, they are regarded in that level, but in America, right. not so. Um, right. And that's why it took them 20 years to get in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which is an absolute disgrace, considering, it is. Um, well, it, you know, yeah. they should be billionaires if they if they had a cent to every guitarist that's gone into a guitar shop and played Smoke in the Water, they'd be billionaires. So, yeah. <laughs> um, no, agreed. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they probably haven't had their due. And I've looked at the, you know, they they, they do a tours and I, I get a sort of sense that they just do a lot of the mid-sized halls. They don't do yeah, the arenas or, or, or in they America do, anymore. Well, they do package package deals like they did a, with Priest and uh, yeah. a couple other deals. Yeah, they're doing some cr- – I know they're in Europe, um, I believe, all year this year. But yeah. I haven't seen – like, I, I can't – I was going to go see them with Priest and I'm like – you know, I'm one of those guys. I'm like a completist. I don't want. Do I want to see him without Richie Blackmore? And do I want to see him play only ten songs? Yeah. You know, this is a band that should be playing over two hours with that yeah. catalog, right? Absolutely. So, so I just my enthusiasm to see them isn't there. I've yeah. seen Rainbow a ton of times. You know. Yeah. With, with, yeah. You know, well, uh, primarily I saw- with Jolyn Turner, but yeah. Yeah. 
it was, I saw, it was easy, you know, I, 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 and I'd like to go with this, you know, maybe deal with a lot of the tracks with you, but there was also this um, opinion that this sounded more like a rainbow album than a deep purple album, which I don't, I can't, I can't uh, see that comparison. Maybe yeah. the songs are a little more commercially accessible, yeah. but with Ian Gillen singing, it's deep purple. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, it doesn't sound like a 70s Deep Purple album. So I think Perfect Strangers sounds like a, um, a 70s Purple album recorded in 1984. It's kind of, it's got a lot of the hammered organ. It's got a, that, that sort of riffage and that fits in with the catalogue. And it's a yeah. perfect lineage between their last Mark II album, which was Who Do You Think We Are? And then a Perfect Strangers. Right. But this one, sounds 80s and it does but you know i'm sorry i don't want to interrupt but i yeah. I, I just I, I have this thought call it a while to me doesn't isn't that far off from my woman from tokyo you know they they have mm. it's that pop they always had that pop sensibility that's what made a great band you know they can yeah they had these jams like child and time and then they had these hit singles like black Knight. that was a, a single yeah. you know they right. were one of those few hard rock bands that had singles so right. smoke in the water went to number four black Knight went to number two in the uk and even if you want to go back to the first um mark which uh, never yeah. gets a lot of um airplay but i like it they were kind of like vanilla fudge very psyche um but yeah with hush which is killer and right. um Quentin Tarantino um, sort of got everyone listening to Deep Purple again with that Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, that slap bang in the, in the middle of that soundtrack. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. you know, it, everyone's grooving on that. But um, I think this has got a little bit of 80s and some of it is a little bit bad 80s in my ears, like some of the cheesy keyboard sounds. I would prefer if Lordy just stuck to the Hammond and had that traditional <laughs> sound because... Um, I, I don't know if it's one of the songs like Spanish Archer or something where he's using this really bad tone on a, a synthesizer. It sounds like a, a banjo or something, but it just sounds really off. And I'm just Spanish thinking. Archer, yeah, but it turns into a really good song in, it's, yeah. in Strange Ways. Mad, it's kind Dog, of like, okay. Mad Dog's the song I'm Mad, talking about. Mad yeah. Dog, okay. Yeah. yeah. But Strange Ways is. Dun, 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 yeah, dun, dun, I like that. Dun, dun, yeah. yeah. No, yeah. I got it confused. It was it's actually Mad Dog, where he's got that you know, really it's bad. Hard for me, it's hard for me to criticize this album because I really like it. Yeah. And I like it even more, you know. I yeah. I think that there's certain instances in bands' careers, if it doesn't sell well, then it gets slagged even more. And for some reason, I think maybe yeah, the, the title, the album cover, um, I don't know, you know, maybe yeah. maybe the landscape of the music at the yeah. time, you know, well, this is they were let, seen let, maybe. Go on, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Let's 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 cover some of the songs. Like, um, yeah. like first song is a killer, "Bad Attitude." I think right. that's that's um, a really really, and I think Deep Purple have got a, a knack of doing great killer first songs. Yes, on their albums, like track listings. So they always do a killer side one, track one. Um, you know, side two, track one. They always do it. Um, and I think um, Bad Attitude is up there. Um, it's a really good riff. The lyrics are tongue-in-cheek, and it's actually Ian Gillen talking to Richie. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> you just... There you go. <laughs> you're in the band and you're, you're writing a lyric about your lead guitarist, so things <laughs> yeah. must have got really poisonous, bad attitude. Yeah. And well, you know, Steven on Tyler... The keyboards. Yeah. Steven Tyler's one of his most famous songs was slagging uh, Joe Perry's wife. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> it happens. Yeah. I think, yeah, those two were poisonous. Uh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, I think I was reading the Blackmore biography, order, uh, biography and um, he had a rule that Gillen was not supposed to get anywhere near his side of the stage. And Gillen would come on his side of the stage and Blackmore would uh, use an expletive and tell him to, you know, piss off. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Just yeah. get back to your side of the stage. <laughs> yeah, I know. But, yeah, th those guys were just hammer and tongs. But um, I think that's yeah. a really, really good track. And, oh, it's great. And it it's ended up, I, I, 
do yourself a favor if you haven't got this. This is Nobody's Perfect, which is the live album of this tour. Look, it's not up there with Made in Japan or Made in Europe, but it's a it's a good document. Gillen's vocals aren't as good, you know, as the 70s heyday. Um, but really good version of that song, Bad Um Bad Attitude. Yeah. Really, really good. And then um you got the unwritten law, which has got that synthesizer beat and um a good lyric in this album, and he's a very underrated lyricist. He does a lot of off-the-wall lyrics. Um, yes. I think you covered that, or it was covered in Born Again. Some of the lyrics in that, <laughs> yeah. that album are just completely yeah. off the wall. Right. <laughs> and yeah. um, and Call of, Call of the Wild, he's got this theme about telephones, hasn't he? Like in um, Born yes. Again, it was Hotline. Yeah. And now he's doing Call of the Wild, so he's got a bit of a theme, a bit of a telephone theme. I don't really like that song that much, Call of the Wild. I'm warming to it, you know, um, but in the I like day it. I didn't like it. I found I it a little it, bit AOR. I don't know. Yeah, I saw it as a good single. Like I said, I, I thought it was yeah. an updated version of My Woman from Tokyo, maybe. I, yeah. You know, I, it's Tokyo, but he, he says Tokyo, you know. So yeah. I, I had no problem with it. it. This album was an easy listen for me when I bought yep. it. I was like, hey, this is, you know, hey. This is good. This is really good, you know. And it would be, it was an easy listen for me. And I still like, I like it even more now. Yeah. Yep. And then yeah. you've got Mad Dog. Um, that's right. got a, a good little, a good little riff. Spanish Arches, a good little song too. Um, yeah. Black and White's great. And Hard Loving Woman is, is na, 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 na. it's got a great riff. Yep, and that yeah. was like a, uh, a sequel. Gillen wrote that as a sequel to In Rock's Hard Loving Man. So right, yeah. Um, so again, that opens side two, and it's a it's a it's a really uh, corker of a song. It um, great riff, and again, that's on the the live album. They didn't do too many songs off this album, so that shows that they weren't really confident in the material. But what they did do was "Bad Attitude" and "Hard Loving Woman," and occasionally yeah. they'd do "Strange Ways." But um, when a band is touring off the back of their album, they don't do many songs. It shows. Yeah, we, we we haven't got confidence in the material, but actually the live right. setting actually Blackmore riffs even more because Blackmore always said that um, when he was in the um, the studio and the light came on, he kind of froze a little bit, not froze, but didn't wasn't as creative as if in a live setting. Um, and you know the live versions of those songs, he just absolutely lets it rip. But um, that's yeah. a great song. What about Mitzi Dupree? That's another off the wall type of lyric, well, isn't it? Yeah, the ping pong one artist. Of the songs. Yeah, I, I think probably probably the weakest song on the album. Um, Could have made a nah. B side. Yeah, I, I you know it. They're trying to go for that bluesy. I don't know. Yeah. I that has the harmonica on it, and if if I have to pick a worse song, that's probably it for me. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like. Love, Yep, go on. I mean, it's it's preceded by Strange Ways, which you know, and I I love that. Uh, yeah, so it, you know, I get the album, and that's where it kind of okay. But you know, you're you're deep in the album by then, and Mitzi Dupree. I'm like, okay, every band's got that song you skip. So yeah. that's probably the weakest song for me on yeah. the album. I kind of like it because it's a little bit different, yeah. bit unusual, and I think it's kind of funny. It's it's a lot of people criticize Gillen with the lyrics but I find it as I said he's an off-the-wall lyricist and for him to you know write a song about <laughs> some <laughs> the queen of the ping pong on a flight I but, yeah I just <laughs> find that quite, quite interesting it's just yeah. it's typical Gillen and um yeah and what's the what, there's the I, I'm, I'm blinking there's a song it, where he sings about the princess just got married or it might be black and white yeah. yeah, the lyrics are yeah, the lyrics are pretty pretty good. Yeah, black and, and white was yeah. just basically about Fleet Street Press and um, yeah, just exactly all, all the headlines go. and very topical. But right. um, no, and um, one of my favorite tracks. I, I know we're going all out of order, but that's fine. Um, right. Just with the track listings, um, I really like Dead or Alive. And that was the song where they had the most problems recording. Apparently, they recorded it multiple times, 
And um, it was recorded in a live setting. So it wasn't sort of one band member does a track and one band member, do- they were all in this live environment. And um, it, I, I think that is when Blackmore actually rips on that song. And um, yeah. it's one of the strongest ones. And that's a really good um, sort of closing to the band. But um, I don't know if I can put this up there with Burn or Machine Head. Um, right. Um, I don't think it's as, as bad or it should be as critically maligned as it was in the day. And I think it has improved. I agree with funny you. Funny enough. I, the whole, um, you know, they're trying to sound contemporary 80s. I never really got, I don't, I don't think this sounds that far off from Perfect Strangers. I mean, I, I, Perfect Strangers did have more of that classic purple feel, but. The Hammond. I, I don't know. I I look at you know in comparison like the White Snake album. Well, you know that 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 got overplayed to death, and he had John Sykes doing his mm. thing. So that's a pretty unique album. But them trying to sound eighties, I don't know. I I, mm. I don't, it still sounds like Deep Purple to me, and Deep Purple is yeah. Deep Purple, you know. And when you bring up uh, 1987, I mean it would that was a monster album and um, a great album. Um, but the thing that dates it now is it was the production was very much of its time and the gated drums. So right. you don't have that organic drum sound. And that's why Coverdale is when he's doing his reissues of um, 1987. And I'm sorry, apologies, everyone. We're going off track, but, um, yeah, but it's when he's doing family. Yeah, when yeah. he's when he's doing the reissues and the box sets, he does a lot of remastered versions with the or, the original drum track without the gated drums without the the gunpowder sounds um and um it sounds fantastic but that's the thing that dates a lot of those bands and the production on this this album which was done by um roger glover who did the twiddle the knobs on perfect strangers he's a conservative producer i don't think he's the greatest producer but he, he's right for the band, um, but I would have preferred personally a Bob Ezrin or somebody that was a little bit more adventurous that would have pushed them sonically and that I think this could have made this even sounding a lot better. Um, right. But it, it certainly doesn't, it's not as dated as um, some of those metal or hard rock albums of the 80s. Um, and I no. think it's a lot of, is around the drums. But the only thing that does date it is some of Lordy's um, synthesizer flourishes. Um, yeah, it sounds a little bit. I, I would have preferred if he did a bit more of the Hammond like Perfect Strangers. Right. I'm just looking at 87 releases now. And, you know, so you had obviously Guns N' Roses was the big one, but it took a while for that to pick up. Yeah. Aerosmith had permanent vacation. I mean, if you want to talk about a, a classic band that just sounded, you know, up, that sounded try to they changed their sound, but that worked for them. Mm. You know, they got outsider writers and and it it was a different sound for them. But they, yeah, you know, well, Purple never did uh, well, uh, they did covers, but they always did their own material. Right. And, yeah. um, so just getting back on a Blackmore's playing, do you, um, I, I, when I was listening to this, I, I sort of think this was one of the last albums. Um, and I, I've still got a lot of, you know, purchased a lot of purple and Blackmore stuff post this album. I think was yeah. this is the last album where he had a little bit of fire in the belly. What do you think about his guitar playing? A bit of fire in the yeah. belly? I totally agree. And I kind of, yeah, he fell off the face of the earth as far as I'm concerned. I lost interest. Mm. I never bought, you know, Slave and, when Slave and Masters came out, I didn't even have any interest. And then when they reformed with this, Again, I didn't buy that album. Maybe I did buy it and hardly listened to it. Yeah. But yeah, I, I totally agree. And then, yeah, Blackmore then went into his uh, whole Blackmore's Night and Baroque yep. music and everything. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, I I understand he's a he's a genius, but yeah, he his legacy, I think, should be bigger as well. Uh I think you should be up there with the Eddie Van Halens and the Jimmy Pages. Absolutely. And, like, yeah, they, does, they all sort of bow to him or not not jimmy yeah. obviously but um eddie's always been said he he was a, a major influence and right. um unfortunately it'll probably take for him to you know pass away when the obituaries come out and everyone says oh wasn't he fantastic 
Right. And, uh, and it was it was a shame that the he was excluded from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You don't know the whole, you know, when they had the induction, he wasn't invited. Um, yeah. But there's always was, a bit of drama. Right. Yeah. But he was, he was, you know, he's the guitarist of that band. You know, when, when mm. he left in the first time and, and Come Taste the Band came out, you know, it's a good album, but it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't have Richie Blackmore on it, you know? It, yeah. It's, it's, Tommy it's, Boland's a it's probably my band. favorite non Blackmore album. I think it's killer. Yeah. But it's, yeah. it's, yeah, it's Deep Purple Mark Four. I love it, but it's not Blackmore. I'm like you. Right. I, I just sort of, I've seen Deep Purple multiple times with Morse. He's a great guitarist, but I always go, oh, I wish Richie was up there. It's just something. There's an edge. He's a dangerous player, and dangerous players right. are exciting to watch because you just don't know what he's going to do. Is he going to throw a yes. water bottle at someone? Is he going to kick um, yeah. Gillen's ass? He What's look. he going to do? He that, right. He has that look. He has. He, yeah. He looks mysterious. He he always looked crazy. You know, he, even if you go back to the you know early videos of Child in Time. Yep. And that you, you, you know is this guy going to fly off the handle? You know what's yeah. going on? Yeah. Yeah. So he had that dangerous part of him that really added to it. Yeah. And there's uh, always been the the ongoing Team Gillen versus Team Blackmore sort of thing. Um, you know. Right. Um, and you sort of think see a lot of um, articles with Gillen, um, a lot of articles by Rich um, Blackmore, and they still talk about each other. They say, oh, look, he left the band ages. I haven't been involved. But they still can't help talking about each other. And even though they guys- mightn't like each other, I think there's a respect because they know without each other, they wouldn't have been where they were. I would think so, but I, is he the reason he wasn't asked to be at the ceremony? Would, Ian Gillen didn't want him there? I don't know. You know? Well, they say they invited him, but he was in Carl, okay. he's Castle Wolfenstein. And <laughs> yeah, but they, they, I, I heard that it, mm. Glenn Hughes and Coverdale have a different story about that. Yeah, so I, I know. I know. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think the thing... Things started to go fall off the rails with Richie um, because I think he thought that Ian Gillen wasn't looking after himself. So Ian Gillen's a party man. So, you yeah. know, the booze and the cigarettes, the late nights, um, even when you look at the Perfect Strangers video clip, you know, you see him in the bar at um, in Vermont with um, with all the crew and he's laughing. That That's Gillen. He's a party animal. Yeah. And right. um, he wasn't looking... Yeah, there was conjecture he wasn't looking after his voice. And it's 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 fact. There were some performances that were subpar on that tour where his vocal chops weren't up to scratch. Um, yeah. There's even conjecture that um, I know on Sea of Tranquility, Pete Pardo and um, a few others have spoken about that they were, they saw the Born Again tour and Gillen was off, you know, out of control, you know, his vocals were just fantastic. I mean, out of control in a positive sense, but they think yeah. that um, he may have blown a, his uh, a gasket, blown his vocals, and it yeah, hasn't I mean, been I, quite the same. I went to that tour, and uh, it was that was a weird show. I mean, the, the one thing I remember about that is because they brought Supernaut out. I couldn't believe they played Supernaut. That's my favorite Sabbath song. Yeah, but even that, you know. We did an episode on that, um, and I don't want to get too far off the track and talk about Black Sabbath, but yep. I don't, I, it didn't sound like Sabbath to me. You know, yeah. when, when I wanted, to, it got to the point when we wanted to listen to Sabbath, we listened to Rich Fire, Witch Finder General or Early uh, Trouble from Chicago. They that sounded like old Sabbath, right? Yep. But um, I don't know. Back to this album, I, for some reason, it just didn't take off. You know, and. And other, I guess the musical landscape was changing uh, mm. because he had, and then you, but you look at an album like Motley Crue, Girls, 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 which I think is a pile of dung, you know, even, yeah. and that sold million, millions and millions and millions of music. So, uh, uh, copies. So maybe, you know, I think a lot of too, you know, you had Def Leppard, you had um, Guns N' Roses. I think too, maybe it was a period where, uh, you know, it was the the heavy metal hard rock scene was becoming more appealing to the female audience. Yeah, and purple didn't fit that mold. You know, no, where- because they're musos, yeah. they're musos, right. and that's why um, this album you don't see them on the cover. You've got a right. a blue light and a door. Open the yeah. door, and even the photos of them, 
they're all soft focus. <laughs> <laughs> right. So they, yeah. you don't see any wrinkles, wrinkles on those. You know, they've right. got the they've gone to the photographer, say, put us in the <laughs> soft focus, make us look yeah. um the best light, right. you know. Richie with yeah. his uh weave, you know, it's all very <laughs> Yeah. But, I don't know, um, maybe they, I, maybe they didn't go eighties enough, you know, yeah. like Aerosmith like Aerosmith did. You know, Aerosmith fit into that mold. It, what about timing? Back. What about timing? Because 1984, 85, they were hot. So yeah. for them to be the second biggest grossing tour in America behind Springsteen's, that's right. That's phenomenal. Exactly. So maybe if they put an album out when it was hot, you know, like within a year and not take a couple of years because it may have, you know, the show, it, they left it too long. You know, they missed, that, the, missed the that's horse. That's a good point. You, one of these, you always wonder because, yeah, wh why did it take them so long to, put, you know, make a follow-up album? But – even, you know, I'm, it, think of their contemporaries at that time. You know, let Jimmy Page wasn't selling anything. You know, Jimmy Page didn't really have a resurgence until he got mm. back with David Coverdale and then got back with Robert Plant in the 90s. You know, and then, yep. then the 70s music resurgence came back with all the reunions, you know. Mm. But Jimmy Page, you know, he had the Outlander album. And I maybe it was just the... They waited too long. They did. There was something that happened. I know something happened with me personally between that period from 1984 to 1987, where mm. I wasn't that enthusiastic about the hard rock and metal that was coming out anymore. Yeah, um, I thought that you know that early part of the 80s, you had the new wave of British heavy metal. You had these dangerous bands coming out of Los Angeles. Then it became too commercialized. So the purple, yeah, it, I think a lot of it was a timing thing. I think you're correct there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know it. Um, I, I think timing is everything, and um, it's it's always when you have a phenomenally successful album, um, it's always difficult to follow it up. Case in point with nineteen eighty seven White Snake, uh, Slip of the. I mean that that's almost going to go diamond. It's up there yeah. at nine million units, and uh, Slip of the Tongue only did one one mil. And right. um, you, you know, went to platinum, and that was the end of the band and their success well, in, he, in, a, in America. He, there you go with you know, you got lineup changes, and, and that's what I always irked me too about that is because John Sykes didn't get his just due, and you know, he was on that album, and he and he was on somewhat. He was on. Um, uh, uh, I'm blanking on it now, but the album before that, but. It, you know, then then he goes to Steve Vai and, you know, he's playing around with his different musicians and the songwriting's just not there anymore. But you're not going to duplicate a Diamond album. It's it's hard to keep that going. But, yeah, the sales dropped off the mat dramatically. Dan Halen did Purple, and so did Def, Def Leppard. They're one of the rare exceptions. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, I'm sure Def Leppard have got two Diamonds. But, yeah, it's yeah, rare, really rare. Yeah, right. Yeah, and that's a whole other episode <laughs> but yeah, as far as deep purple i think i think you nailed it. It, it it's the timing and i don't know if i i don't necessarily agree that they tried to sound contemporary i don't i i like i said i think it's a really good album i think it's more of a timing thing where it didn't sell and maybe they should have struck when the island was hot and recorded this a year or two you know earlier I put it to a number of factors. I put it to the album cover because I really think it's it's not that great. Um, right. I think that, um, you know, maybe there was some, um, yeah, timing. It, they got it at the wrong time. So it should have been recorded around 1986. So while when they got off that Perfect Strangers tour, they should have pumped this out straight away and not waited. Right. And... I think that um, even the acrimony between Blackmore and Gillen probably affected um, the band. Oh, um, most definitely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, the commitment um, levels of the band on this material, if, the, if you've got the two alphas fighting and um, not getting on, then that would affect um, everything else. And also Blackmore having an injury in that 1987 tour, that would have just yeah. taken the momentum out. Um, yeah. But they did headline a big tour in, um, or I think there was this big concert in New York City, I think uh, uh, at the Mets Dodgers Stadium, uh, supported by Aerosmith. 
Really? All yes, right, to- and Guns N' Roses. <laughs> okay, so yeah. I know Aerosmith and Guns N' Roses played Giants Stadium. Yeah, uh, well, okay, maybe but, I'm wrong. So, yeah, yeah Giants, yeah. Yeah. So but they they football- were able to jag out a, um, a huge performance there, but okay. I don't think the American tour was as successful the next no. time around. You didn't um, really hear about it that much. Yeah. I, you know, it, it kind of fell off the radar. I, it, as far as me going to shows at that point, I went to some shows here and there, you know, the weirdest show probably I went, you know, I saw, I saw the cult, you know, it's here you go. The cult came out with electric that year, yep. but I remember yep. seeing guns and roses open up for Alice Cooper and they could, they almost canceled the show because of the lack of ticket sales. Wow. And then, you know, okay. several months later, guns you know that appetite album explodes yeah you know right after that but yeah yeah i i I, maybe yeah i i I think you nailed it because it's the timing the album cover yeah it's it it's uh the personal politics that play because you know if, if, if everyone's not harmonious then you know sort of uh um yeah they're not on board sort of thing right and I think I think a big, but you know, I'm I'm thinking of Motley Crue, and they check all those boxes, and they they still sold millions of albums. And I think that they didn't appeal to the. I, I think the female uh, audience was the big change from '84 to this period of time. You know, I went to when I went to see White Snake during the. You know, going back to that album because that was the big, that was the huge album. You know, I took my sister and her friend to a White Snake concert where. Back in 1983, 84, they were opening up for Quiet Riot and it was all guys. And we left when Quiet Riot came on stage, you know? And so it, it definitely, the, the band started appealing more. Same thing with Aerosmith. You know, when when I went to Aerosmith back in the day, it was all guys, you know, and Aerosmith couldn't play because they were all messed up on drugs. Then Permanent Vacation comes out and it's, the female audience gets bigger and bigger. Now you see them at their residency in Las Vegas and it's over half females, you know, listening to the more, the, the newer quote unquote newer songs, you know, a lot of them are eighties, nineties, but mm. yeah. It, it, so I think that hurt deep purple as well here with house of blue light. I, I buy the album. I listen to it. I'm like, Hey, yeah. this is a great follow up to perfect strangers. We're going to yep. the, the classic lineup staying together. This is a great yep. album. I'm yep. thinking it's going to, it's going to go, platinum and it it didn't yeah i think it was i think it was a very competitive um climate at the moment there were a lot of happening bands on the way up and yeah they um by leaving it too long they just went down a few notches another thing that i just wanted to bring into it is because the 1984 tour was so successful because there was a lot of nostalgia so they broke up this mark through r2 had not performed since 1973 and this is their first tour in such a long time so a lot of people bought perfect strangers saw the tour were um of that vintage um of the 70s and had the nostalgia and then when it was a couple of years later maybe that's it you know there was like a maybe it was a limited shelf life for this band um but i do think you know, at I, that peak. I, I know that I know they briefly got together with this lineup again um, in the '90s, but then oh, yeah. left and they in the Battle on Range is on, and that yeah. was a ter- terrible album. If, if they, if, if the, again, that, I think that's really the the politics within the band hurt them because that was the period. You know, you had the Eagles, you had Kiss, you had Page mm. Plant, you had Black Sabbath with Ozzy coming back, and these did huge tours in numbers yep. selling out venue after venue i yep. think if they could have kept this unit together in the mid 90s and had some big promotion in back of it they would have, they would have been up there too selling out these big stadiums because yeah. people were starving for that 70s nostalgia you yeah know? and uh unfortunately that didn't happen yeah and it's left it too yeah. late i i don't think i want to see them you know gillen and blackmore in, the, in Deep Purple now. I think that the ship has sailed. Yeah. I, I saw Blackmore. I actually travelled from uh, Australia to um, to England um, six years ago and saw the the Rainbow with uh, the O2 with Blackmore. And um, yeah, sadly, he was a, a shadow of himself. Um, really? He's got, like, he's, he's in his 70s. He's got arthritis. 
And um, he can't play those really fast runs, but he's still got the tone. You can still hear the tone. And it okay. was really a really strange night because I was watching it. I was willing him to, you know, be like he was in the 80s and 90s. And it just didn't quite get there. And um, he was going, I think he was doing uh, what the deficiency he had in his dexterity with his hands. I think he was just, just making up in tone and playing a cue stick and, um yeah, it was a bit disappointing. Um, but you've got to imagine he's he's like in his seventies and he can't do this flashy guitar work. And I well, think this, this album behind me is the last time he had fire in the belly and you I had agree. those that real Blackmore um flash because um Slaves and Masters um and the battle rages on, I think that was the beginning of a bit of a downward spiral. Um I'm not familiar with Blackmore Night, so a lot of viewers might say, "Oh, what about Blackmore Night?" I it's yeah, I, I, I got off the got off the wagon. Sorry, viewers. Even that Rainbow, uh, the Stranger in Us All, I got that. Didn't like that. I thought, yeah, I think this is the last probably. But I'll tell you what, you know, solid you bring, performance. You know, I because I, I you, with Deep Purple, I always have to think of the family tree, you know, because there's so yeah. many incarnations and so many offerings. I'll tell you what, that Glenn Hughes is a friggin', he's a freak of nature. Absolutely. So you bring up, you, know, you bring up seeing Blackmore. So I, I saw him, he did a purple tour and it was smaller venues in the U S. So I saw him mm. at like a, I don't know, 2,500 seat venue, uh, about 40 miles West of Chicago. Yep. They have a lot of bands play there. He brought it, man. And he played all the Coverdale era. And he even played Getting Tighter off of Come Taste the Band. Yeah. But it was phenomenal. And he had his backing. He had this drummer. That's it, it's another thing that blows my mind, the talent that's out there. This drummer that probably no one has ever heard. And they played You Fool No One. And his drum solo was one of the best things I've ever seen ever out of a drummer. And it's just yeah. this guy. He's playing backup to Glenn Hughes. But Glenn Hughes partied his – I mean, he – he almost killed himself with cocaine and yeah. he still has his voice. He's still in incredible shape. And, and you know why so, he's still got his voice is because, um, and I think I've sent this in an early episode, in the um, the late 80s and 90s, he basically um, was preserved. He didn't, he didn't tour. He didn't, I mean, he did records, but he didn't tour like your Gillens and your Coverdale's because Coverdale, his voice is not the same. He's flogged oh, his voice. I, I, I he's, heard it. Yeah. He's yeah, flogged I, his voice to death. And I think I, the decline he's, was he's, on that slip worse, of the tongue yeah. tour. He's almost, he's just as bad as Paul St and Stanley. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. Because they, they flogged there. their voice. That's the thing. Yeah. They flogged it. Right. But Glenn you Hughes, know. because he was in, um, you know, he had a lot of um, drug problems, preserved his voice because he didn't tour. And that's right. why he's one of those few vocalists of his age that's just absolutely outstanding. Yeah. And he keeps in, and he got, he, he got clean and he keeps himself in incredible shape. So he, you have to give him he, credit there. He is yeah. indeed. He is indeed. Yeah. But yeah. I think, yeah, I think this is the last solid purple album my opinion is it's not a patch on the 70s output um but it's definitely it doesn't um deserve the the knocks that it, it it's got i think it, it's actually improved with age i still prefer perfect strangers because perfect strangers have a couple of tracks that are just so outstanding you've got knocking at your back door you've got perfect strangers um and there's a couple of other tracks um you know uh on a, on a song level, I think they're better than this. But this album, um, it's solid, and I don't think it deserves the uh, the raps that it's got. I totally agree with you. I I I, I would say I I want to I don't want to say I love this album, but I really 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 like this album. Yeah, and I agree with you. This is the last really good thing that Purple has done. Absolutely. But I want to thank you because I have re rediscovered this album. I haven't listened to it in years and I always liked it and I've been listening to it all week and it's, I, it, I enjoy it thoroughly. And, For sure. Uh, well, we'll yeah. do this again. We'll do another under, you know, sort of long forgotten album, bring it back. We'll put a fresh Let's set of ears and Let's do it. Do it. A bit and of, we got to talk yeah. about, we're going to talk about Jack White too. Absolutely. Um, and, absolutely. Yeah. I'm going to see him live in a couple of weeks. So I, I would love that. I'm going to love that discussion. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, viewers, you tell me what you think of this album. Do you like it? You don't put your comments, 
please subscribe to Rock Day Dream Nation. Um, we've got a super group, which Joe's going to be on. We're going to do I'm the. Gonna, yeah, I'm going to do that. Yep, yeah, we're doing a super group heavy metal, putting together your fantasy group involving them. So you I know, hope you I allow make- me to bring. I hope you allow me to bring in a psychiatrist because it's going to be needed with my band. Oh, so that's all okay. I'm going to say. I like that. Right. I like the controversy. Right. <laughs> Putting a super group out of um, Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, Michael Schenker group, um, Motorhead. Um, it's if, just to name a few. That, that's going to be a killer episode. Um, did an episode a week ago um, about David Bowie, Aladdin, Sane versus Siggy. That's going really well. Uh, check that out. Um, plenty more content. We're going to do well, a show you- on the knack in about a week's time. So if I can lots of, lots add of something, Peter, all your episodes have, are great. Uh, your episode on female singers is one of my favorites because that's Thanks, like Joe. my week. Yeah. 99% of the time, if there's a female singer, I like it. I just, yeah. just my heart melts, right? So, no, you just have a great show. I'm, thanks for having me on. No, and, uh, absolutely. Yeah. All right. All right. See you later, guys. See ya.